By the spring of 1624, the Plymouth colony had been inundated for several years now by many people that they would refer to as strangers, people who did not share their separatist or brownist views. And in fact, for much of their history up to this point, the separatists, the Pilgrim Fathers, so to speak, were the minority in the Plymouth settlement. And yet they held on to the power of governing that settlement, which proved to be harder and harder to accomplish, as even their investors back in England did not really approve of their religious beliefs or the, how they chose to organize themselves in separation from the Anglican Church, and found their lack of any formal clergy in the settlement to be of concern. So in 1624, they sent over Reverend John Lyford, who quickly found that this separatist minority who consolidated power around themselves had been denying other people the right to worship how they saw fit. In his letters back to England and back to the Plymouth investors, he came to see the Plymouth settlement as being a sort of breakaway commonwealth, using funds from English investors, but having no intention of becoming part of a greater English empire or even being associated with merry old England. In his view, the minority were oppressing the majority, even in their own colony, creating an unwelcoming place that would ultimately lead to failure of the endeavor and a loss of investment to all of the merchant adventurers back in England. All of this could be remedied, of course, by a change of leadership, especially if the investors insisted upon it, and the installation of proper Puritan services, not separatists, not brownist, Puritan services that were at least still nominally within the umbrella of the Anglican Church. Of course, the governor of Plymouth had many of these letters intercepted, and ultimately the Pilgrim Fathers decided to banish Reverend John Lyford, along with his strongest supporter, John Oldham. These two men were made to walk the gauntlet. In other words, on their banishment, on their way out of town, the pilgrims lined up on both sides of them and were encouraged to hit them with the butt ends of their muskets. Having been in New England for less than a year, and perhaps only knowing the natives that the pilgrims were aligned with, the Wampanoag, what were they to do now? Where were they to go? Welcome back to the podcast. In our last episode, we saw the second colony of Wessagusset fall apart, as well as this grand scheme by the Council for New England to develop a overarching New England colony with a grand government and a feudal order. Much to the Pilgrims' delight, that all fell apart. But from these two failed Wessagussets and the various fishing camps that were now extending southward along the coast, Plymouth was inundated with many new people who were not of the separatist faith. But also, the general area of what would now be Massachusetts or southern New England was starting to fill in with a very thin layer of English people who were setting up their own little petty kingdoms of sorts. Small little colonies, little hamlets, sometimes an individual homestead, a freehold, all to themselves. Sometimes sanctioned by the Council for New England, sometimes just land they bought from the natives. These entities all existing without some larger colonial order. In other words, your locale is your colony. It is your order. But many of these men, and often their families, lived without much of any order. They're more or less castaways on a continent without investors, without backing from England, without any sort of mandate other than keeping themselves alive. And so that's where we find our two Johns, John Lyford and John Oldham who were cast out of Plymouth quite violently. They ended up at the site of Nantasket, where, believe it or not, other Plymouth castaways had congregated, along with a few men left over from Wessagusset and the various fishing operations. The unofficial de facto leader there was a man by the name of Roger Conant, who had moved to Plymouth in 1623 and found the conditions there to be quite stifling. It appears he chose to move away from Plymouth and did not have a violent exit at the uh, hands of a gauntlet, and he and his family formed the core of this new settlement at Nantasket. As with all the English in this area, they make their living fishing, trading with the natives for furs, and trying to do some farming, the rough New England coast soil not being very forgiving to their farming efforts. As such, they knew in the long run something else would have to be done, some other arrangement, some other location, and of course, some investment back in England. 
And with that, some sort of paperwork from the Council for New England, something that would legitimize their operations. Lacking these things, when the Nantasket settlers heard about a new settlement to their north, about as far away from them as they were from Plymouth, that seemingly checked all of these boxes, their interest was piqued. As it turns out, in the year 1623, back in merry old England, Reverend John White, who was firmly in the Puritan wing of the Anglican establishment, believed he could organize a company to take advantages of the resources of the New World and enrich his local community, especially those fellow Puritans of his specific congregation. He believed he could see the New World with sturdy fishermen farmers and their families who could outcompete other fishing operations by being able to supply their own food through their farming activities, grow the colonies through natural increase, and convert natives through friendly trade and cooperation. The fisherman farmer advantage was an idea that had been floating around for a while in England. It had been tried with Gosnold's colony, for instance. So this wasn't a unique idea for John White. By stocking this colony with people from his congregation, his fold, they would be trusted members of this transatlantic business in the time when the world was still quite large. And you could seemingly take something and disappear into the endless void. It was important that your business relations were closely tied with your familial or your community relations. It was believed the chances of your funds being squandered or stolen would be far less if your investors and employees were part of your community. Now, at this early date, the need for Puritans to seek a refuge wasn't quite as strong as it would be by the end of the decade. And so the company that John White forms, the Dorchester Company, originally was meant to enrich his community, not save his community or provide refuge for his community. But we know things can change. The Dorchester Company received a license from the Council for New England, very strapped for cash at the time, in February of 1622, with permission to settle a site for a base of operations along the New England coast. The license specifically was granted to one Richard Bushrod. In February of 1623, Sir Walter Earle received a land patent on behalf of the Dorchester Company from, again, the Council of New England. And these two patents and licenses pushed together made up the legal existence of the Dorchester Company's claims in the New World. By 1623, the Dorchester Company had 119 or 120 investors in total. These investors would have, say, in the general court of the company, which of course would be housed in Dorchester, England. As was proper for the time, the true governance of any of these colonies would be from England. In other words, power to govern would be delegated downward from the king onto the Council for New England, again housed in England, and involving their second Wessagusset colony in our last episode, they would send over their representative, their lieutenant, to be the governor general. But the power to govern ultimately resides back in that body, back in England. It was the same thing with the Dorchester Company, who received a right to govern their settlement at Cape Ann, but the board, the council that would do this governing, would still be housed in England. The king and the council had no intention of making breakaway republics or even semi-independent colonies. And the Dorchester Company was not about to change that expectation. At least not yet. In the same year, 1623, John White sends over his first crew to form the colony of Cape Ann. These would be 14 fishermen, no women, no children yet, whom he described as an industrious hive of pious fishermen farmers. They were led by one Thomas Gardner, and together the men made quick work to develop some sort of dwelling for themselves. They made houses with thatched roofs and delicate clay and wood chimneys. You can imagine the amount of care needed to operate a chimney made out of clay and wood. The next year in 1624, the Dorchester Company would formally organize their council and send out another 18 settlers to Cape Ann, along with some cattle. And though things seemed promising back in England, the work was hard at Cape Ann. And a profitable fishery depended on catching fish, gutting fish, and drying them on racks. Of course, with the application of salt to help with preservation. And so the Cape Ann settlers built a salt works to make salt. But it was destroyed by a fire. Perhaps because it was utilizing a stick and clay uh, fireplace. And then from 1624 into 1625, the area actually became quite crowded. In addition to the people who were working for the Dorchester Company, there were other fishing operations that would move up and down the coast. 
and take over fishing areas and drying areas that the Cape Ann settlers thought was their own. But their biggest threat actually came from the Plymouth colony, who thought that they were the injured party. Because in 1623, Lord Sheffield of the Council for New England had already purchased the fishing rights off the vicinity of Cape Ann and had already sold those rights to John Winslow and Robert Cushman of Plymouth. The Council for New England kept terrible records and often gave out overlapping grants. This is going to happen over and over again. And supposedly the Plymouth settlers were shocked when they found the Dorchester Company operating in what they considered their zone of economic exclusivity. In the spring of 1625, the men from Plymouth accused the Cape Ann settlers of using a nearby fishing stage that the Plymouth settlers had built. The solution that the Pilgrims came up with was to send Miles Standish to Cape Ann. And now, if you listen to previous episodes, you know that Miles Standish is their hired heavy. He is not the guy um, for whom to negotiate with. When he was sent out to Wessagusset, he returned with decapitated heads. To use a Star Trek analogy, Plymouth didn't send out its Deanna Troy, it sent out Worf. But in this case, the Dorchester men were not intimidated by the five foot three Standish and the small force he brought with him, and they stood ready to fight. And this is when we re-meet some characters from the beginning of the episode. Roger Conant of Nantasket, about halfway between Cape Ann and Plymouth, steps in as a third party arbitrator. Now, Conant wasn't exactly neutral, as we know. Roger left the Plymouth colony and had been living for two years or so now with other castaways of Plymouth. Also, something that Standish probably didn't know is that Roger's brother was one of the Dorchester investors. But something that Standish probably did know is that Roger was not a fan of Miles Standish. Roger said that Standish never entered the school of our Savior Christ. And indeed, Standish, at least at that point, was not much of a separatist or a Puritan. He was an earthly man and a military man. Useful, but not in line with the views of Plymouth or the Dorchester Puritans. Nevertheless, Conant negotiated on behalf of the Dorchester Company and Miles Standish of Plymouth, and they came to a resolution that the Cape Ann settlers would build a new set of drying racks for the Plymouth settlers, a new drying stage, sometimes called a skate. And then Roger Conant had his own plans and suggestions for the Dorchester Company, which would be, first and foremost, to abandon the Cape Ann settlement, which was neither great for farming nor fishing, and by 1625 still had not created any salt, which would have been one of their cost-saving measures, and did not create any surplus crops, the soil there being sandy and fishermen not being terribly good at farming. His last suggestion for the Dorchester Company is that he become in charge of this new settlement. Their former leader was described as a very drunken beast, not quite the vision John White had for the leadership of the colony of these sturdy Puritan types undertaking hard work and ventures to see if they would receive signs from God of their elect status. Perhaps his brother pulled a few strings, but Roger Conant gets the job. The Dorchester Company puts him in charge of the Cape Ann settlers, and they make John Lyford their minister. At this point, many more from Nantasket fold into Cape Ann, but many of the original Cape Ann settlers elect to go home. The location Conant picks is a place the natives called Naumkeeg. And before they could really even settle in, the Dorchester Company got cold feet and decided to pull the plug on the entire investment. They sent ships to come pick up everyone. But on that ship was also a private letter to Conant from John White, asking them, not as a representative of the Dorchester Company, about to fall into shambles, but as an individual to keep the colony going and that John White would organize support of that colony from England. Now it's on Conant to convince these people to stay. He convinces them that these funding problems back in England are small, tiny, minuscule, not terribly important, and that if we were to abandon this great venture, we should wait for what he called the providence of God. The Puritans are always looking for signs. John White, when he heard the new settlement is called Numkeeg, he turned to the Bible where he found the Hebrew word Nahum, and he found it similar enough that he considered this a good omen and something worth preserving. And so at this point, 1626, Cape Ann is no more, and now we have Numkeeg, and we have about 30 people under Roger Conant and John Lyford, who is the reverend. 
And on faith alone, the colony survives as the Dorchester Company crumbles into nothing. John White writes them encouraging letters, and one of them, he writes, Building houses, the first stones of the foundation are buried underground and are not seen. So in planting colonies, the first stocks employed that way are consumed, although they serve for a foundation to the work. And with those words, the Numkeag settlers held out through 1626, 1627, while John White toiled away, moving through influential circles, finding deep pockets, and using their occupation in the New World to stake out a new claim with a new purpose, as being a Puritan in England became less and less tolerable. New England might now have to serve as a place of refuge for the Puritans, just like it was 10 years or so before for the separatists of Leiden, for whom we call the Pilgrim Fathers. Back on the Council for New England, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias was no fan of the separatists, and he was a high Anglican, so he wasn't a fan of the Puritans either. But, although still a member, by the end of the 1620s, Sir Ferdinando Gorgias had distanced himself from the Council for New England. That brought him no income and no prestige and actually ended up causing this separatist colony to exist, creating an unsavory connection to himself. So by the late 1620s, a high-ranking Puritan by the name of the Earl of Warwick actually ascended to the presidency of the Council for New England. John White organizes from the ashes of the Dorchester Company what he called the New England Company, a name that will be used again for other companies in the future. This new company makes a man by the name of John Endicott from John White's congregation the new governor of Numkeag and all the land in this new patent, but only governor in the sense that he will represent the council of the New England Company in the New World. Someone who seemingly did not hear about this would be Roger Conant. About 50 colonists leave in June of 1628 for the New World, bringing tons of new supplies that the Numkeag settlers would love to have their hands on, and also tons of alcohol. They arrive in Numkeag in September of 1628, and Conant does not want to relinquish authority to Endicott. When paperwork is shown, he eventually relents. But what would become known as the old planters, the at most 60 or so settlers at Numkeag under Conant, quickly became annoyed with these new colonists who were staying in the houses that they had built, who had been taking over the gardens that they had planted. At one point, Endicott, the new governor, demands that a building that they had made at Cape Ann be moved to the vicinity of Numkeag, a whole building, piece by piece. When they finally came to some sort of agreement with one another and peace between the two groups, Numkeag was renamed Salem, as in Salem, Massachusetts. But the peace was not long-lasting. These old planters, a term that also applied to the scattered English found throughout the greater Boston area, were quickly alienated by this new Puritan influx. We talked about a few of them in our last episode. And of the ones that lived in Salem specifically, many of the old planters removed themselves after a while, and they founded the town of Beverly, which Endicott's people called Beggarly. The creature that these old planters had helped to sustain through the meek years and give birth to was out of their control. By 1629, 200 more settlers were coming into Salem under Reverend Francis Higginson, and with him came a whole bunch of new paperwork and a new charter. As it turns out, the New England Company had quickly been turned into the Massachusetts Bay Company. Swallowing up all these rights and privileges it received from the Council for New England, it actually went above the head of the council and had all of these things confirmed by the king himself. As you can imagine with that, there was a flood of new investment, and they bought out Robert Gorgeous's old patent, so there would be no dispute over Massachusetts Bay. And come June 22nd, 1630, the little settlement of Salem is inundated with a thousand new colonists coming under the Massachusetts Bay Company. The order of the old planters completely washed away. But now let's keep the ball rolling because the Massachusetts Bay Company was supposed to govern this colony at a distance from England, like everyone else that we talked about. But the Massachusetts Bay Company, their council, decided to take their charter and relocate the company in the New World to the Massachusetts Bay, in effect, turning the company's general court 
into a colonial government, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Now, I want you to take in the significance of this moment. Sir Ferdinando Gorgias, no fan of the Puritans, having started the Council for New England, had no intention of allowing this to happen. Plymouth was bad enough. But now, the Massachusetts Bay Company had turned itself into a self-governing colony, seemingly only answerable to the king himself. These old planters spread throughout what would now be the state of Massachusetts, outside of the Plymouth portion, fell under the domain of this new government. And a group of these old planters, who lived at Salem, were responsible for the destruction of the autonomy that all of them enjoyed, some of them being Plymouth castaways, as we mentioned before. Which brings us to another interesting conclusion, that many of the Plymouth castaways helped the Massachusetts Bay Company come into existence, where their occupation came to show that they did not have a dead claim. Now, if you didn't notice, there is no state of Plymouth today. There is a state of Massachusetts. Spoiler alert, the Massachusetts colony will come to absorb the Plymouth colony many years in the future of our timeline. And in this greater colony of Massachusetts, often described by English officials as a independent, illegal commonwealth, the descendants of these Puritans and these separatists, these old planters, independent-minded castaways, will take up arms and confront British regulars at Concord's North Bridge in 1775. 